it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our good professor who has arrived uh, here this morning, uh, Somadoda Fikeni. He's the chairperson of the Independent Development Trust. Just to tell you very little about him, he's got an exceptionally long CV, which I know that you all got in your, in your packs there, but he's, he's exceptionally qualified in so many different areas. But um, he was born in the Eastern Cape, so we're going to get some Eastern Cape pride here after the Northern Cape. Um, educationally, <laughs> We've got to have some representation. Uh, educationally, he acquired his BA and BA honors from the University of Transkei, that is currently now the Walter Sassouli University. He's also studied peace and political studies. Peace and political studies. Peace and politics. I'm still working that one out. We're going to have to go and have a cup of coffee just now, Prof, and try and work that out, how you, you study peace and political studies in one course. Um, at McMaster University in Canada, and then also obtained his MA in International Politics and Comparative Development at Queen's University also in Canada. He went on to obtain his doctoral studies and PhD in Comparative Politics and Public Analysis at Michigan State University. His areas of expertise are policy analysis, comparative politics, research, research methodology, international politics, political economy, and heritage. Love talking to him about heritage, and more importantly, love talking to him about politics. He's here, he's with us. Let's give the good professor a round of applause. There he is. Thank you very much for the kind words that Lien introduced me, and I'm hoping that someone was recording this because I could use this small clip whenever I'm going for any job interview. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much for the leadership of the SACP CMP the distinguished audience here, the practitioners, the professionals, the experts. It's such an honor to be invited to speak. And I always knew that uh, the sector specialist would be here and they would be very technical in form. So I decided I'll have a different approach to it in reflecting on the political landscape. As a political scientist, as a heritage specialist, as a community developer, I was wondering what I could be saying to this audience this morning. But I want to start by thanking Nomvula, my former colleague, where I was her boss at some stage for her insistence because I was saying to her, why on earth would you invite people who are involved in negotiations for fees must fall? when we are in this quick shifting sense. We spend time until 10 p.m. last night, having started at 10 a.m. That's the scale of challenges that we face. What I'm going to speak to this morning is the issue of the political psychology in construction industry. And one might be wondering what the hell is political psychology? <laughs> in a minute, we will appreciate and understand. Twenty-two years into our democracy, there is one reality we face. We are not where we were in 1994, but certainly we are not where we intended to be. 
This reminds me of Reverend Fingas Diosoga Memorial Lecture, where he referred to this time as a time between times and a space between spaces. Of course, as a good priest, he was using the biblical narrative of those who had to travel from the bondage towards the promised land. And it is said that particular distance is a distance you could walk and finish in eight days, but it took them 40 years to complete. During the greater part of those 40 years, they were not where they started, but they were not where they intended to be. They were in a time between times. They were in a space between spaces. In many ways, as a country, we've taken a detour. And when you have professionals having come here today, the main task is how to trace the highway that we lost. The country is at the crossroads today. Decisions we make will determine the trajectory of our destiny. Not what government decisions are, but what each role player in the business sector, in the civil society, in your professional sector, in government play. Because very often we have outsourced our ability to imagine a future because we are waiting for government to do everything. The one thing in our political transition that has become quite obvious is that we made a number of assumptions about our transition. And most of those have come back to bite us. The first assumption was that there is something called South African exceptionalism. We were unique. We didn't have to learn anything from anyone. Instead of understanding the hard truth of any political transition and compared to other post-colonial nations to see how economic, social, and political transition is carried out. The second one we said our transition was a miracle. As a social scientist, I can't analyze a miracle because it just happens. Then we went on to deploy a number of concepts such as we are a developmental state when we knew we were not a developmental state. We were closer to being a welfare state. We ought to have said we aspire to be a developmental state. What does it take to get there? What will the business sector do? What will government do? What will all the other role players look like? As we meet today, the economy is not doing that well. There are social upheavals with students and other sectors demanding more at the time when the country seemed to have less. The ruling party is experiencing some of its great challenges which will be with us for the next two years at least as it prepares for the leadership succession.
But now let me come to the point of a political psychology and connect these dots. If you have a team in sports, it may have all the technical equipments, the gymnasium, may be registered with Virgin Active, every member. They may have a good diet. But if their psychology is not the one of a team with a common purpose, whatever facilities they have may not make that much of a difference. We do know that the infrastructure that we have is mainly a government-driven infrastructure as it should be close to a trillion in the next few years. As people in the construction industry, you are well attuned to that. The budget review confirmed that. But the question is, how are we positioned to make an impact out of that? There are certain deficits in the country that I think I want to start with before we even focus on how the sector, the transformation project could deal with those. As South Africa, we suffer from an acute, not budget deficit, not trade deficit, but honesty deficit. Our conversations are not honest. What we say between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. is not the same thing that we say amongst our friends even as professionals in the sector. For a nation to have that difficult conversation, you must have an honest conversation about the state of the sector. But if you come and you say, what kind of people are they? What phrases should I use so that they sort of think I'm with them? You're not doing this country any favor. Whether it's on transformation issues, on fronting, corporate social responsibility, or any other thing, we need, as an ingredient of the sector, honesty. It is for that reason that you have the big businesses, the small businesses, uh, you know, BUSA, BBC, not the British Broadcasting Corporation, but uh, <coughs> the Black Business Council. <coughs> because people like Leanne from the media, if you say BBC several times, it may invoke something. It is not trust deficit that even, and uh, I mean the, the National uh, Development Plan say, talks about. It's honesty deficit, because trust can only come when you have an honest conversation. The other one is courage deficit. Even when we see the truth, we can't articulate it because I'm waiting for that tender, I want to be included in that company, and so forth. And this is not just the government disease alone. I'll give you some of the anecdotes. And the other one is vision deficit. Very often we're working on what will happen next year, what will happen next month, Will I have a tender? Will I buy that Range Rover? 
we do not have a sense of saying people who built the pyramids in Egypt, people who built the Taj Mahal in India, people who built the Great Wall in China, people who put up a Statue of Liberty and so forth. Those were great visionaries who looked beyond themselves. Sometimes they embarked on a journey to deal with meager construction and engineering projects because they answered to the call of Franz Fanon, who in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, opens one chapter with something which says every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. So we ought to be saying, given the scale of opportunities in the construction sector, given the scale of challenges in our social, political, and economic space, what is the sector prepared to do to play its role? Nowhere on earth can government solve all the problems. It doesn't happen. And we should disabuse our minds of always blaming the government when the weather is bad, when there is drought, when the bus has not arrived and so forth, and begin to say, could it be that we are the leaders we've been waiting for? Each one of us. In that small space, in that community where I am, have I been able to stand and deliver? Let's start with the government side. Government has had problems of policy certainty, which is a great frustration for most of you in the sector. No long-term vision that everyone has bought into. Countries like China, Malaysia had their 50-year plans and they stuck to them. It didn't matter which minister was coming. In our case, when a minister changes, they start changing the furniture, they change the PA, the DG, the strategy, as if it's from an opposition party. Same political party. And that has created and frustrated the capacity to implement. The second one is patronage networks where wrong people are deployed. Because you happen to be loyal to so and so, you happen to be in this or that faction. Those militate against any progression. The third one is the lack of coordination generally. One department does its own thing, another one its own thing. When you go to international conferences, sometimes it is embarrassing as a South African because even in investor conferences, one group comes, oh, we didn't know that you are here. The ambassador doesn't even know who has come in. <laughs> and very often, we do not even know why we are there. And we won't report back as to why we had to be there. All we do, we ask our PAs to Google and invite ourselves to world conferences. <laughs> and this is not only in government, by the way. Seated in this conference, do we ever reflect on the problem of this country which is so over-conferenced and over-workshopped with less time on delivery and impact? 
When you take on a plane, you sleep in a hotel, you rent a car, someone in some village could get that money and start a barber shop and they are set for life. But both in government and the private sector, the sense of the elite entitlement to a certain lifestyle and the lack of sensitivity to the plight of the other, the deficit of Ubuntu. If I'm fine, when I drive through those traffic lights, the people who are sleeping on the sidewalks, I no longer see them because I'm okay. Therefore, you can't transform your sector if you are insulated from the realities of life. If you can throw away things to the garbage without ever thinking that I could be giving these things to someone else, you could be a construction engineer, you could be owning a construction company, you could be a quantity surveyor, it doesn't matter. If what matters, which has become a dominant political psychology of South Africans, the most important thing is me, myself, and I. It is for that reason that even in politics, and some businesses. Over the last 10 years, we have seen the weakening of institutions and the personalization of power. When you think of different institutions, I didn't know who was the CEO or chairperson of SABC, I mean of uh, SAA for years, but now it has a face and a name. And then pow, those who want to corrupt the system will just go to that person. NPA, it didn't matter who was there. SABC. And many other state-owned entities. And yet, most of this infrastructure we're talking about will be handled by those entities. where patronage networks are so deeply entrenched. If you meet so-and-so, your things will be sorted. Instead of saying, if you meet certain standards, your future is predictable. But such patronage cannot exist without insidious relationship between business and the private sector. Do we know who is funding political parties? Private sector, biz big businesses, they do not come wearing any t-shirt because they want to influence the regulatory space, they want to influence where tenders go not only for the ANC, for the DA, for other parties as well. Because we factionalize even our thinking about these things. Corruption is equal to ANC. Corruption is equal to black people. Even the media doesn't assist us in that space. When Kaiser Modaung's son was involved in Bombella Stadium corruption, we saw his face. He was in the front pages of newspapers. When the big four construction companies were involved, we didn't see the faces. We didn't even see the logos. And their story was often on page 17 of the business sector. It is that dual consciousness and dishonesty that can destroy the sector. 
If it's corruption, it's corruption. Don't use technical terms. Collusion. A villager, <laughs> a villager doesn't know what that is. You start looking for some complex, convoluted adjectives to describe corruption. The other truth is that in a country where you do have high concentration of ownership and power in few companies in each sector in this country, you go to mobile telephone industry, you know it's Vodacom MTN. If you are a small player, you'll rise and die. Banking sector, you have four banks. Construction, you can count them. They are here building Sentin. Each you turn here, you see a logo. <coughs> you know where the power is. <coughs> Such concentration of power in few players doesn't allow for the rise of emerging industries. It's just natural. It's not a South African phenomenon you'd have to diversify that space because the disproportionate allocation of resources and power. You saw with the World Cup that uh, small subcontracted companies were just left to do painting, otherwise the major thing <coughs> was gone. I was the chair of the South African Heritage Resources Agency for some years, and each time a ministerial building was being revamped, you'd find this ridiculous price, 28 million, to refurbish a minister's house, a mayor house in Swan, 90 million. You say, but how is it possible that a house whose value is 14 million could then be refurbished for 28 million. There is some magic in that. Can you imagine you buy a car for 500,000, you say, I've gone to repair it, they say it's 1.3 million. <laughs> what is the cost structure? What is the pricing? It is that magic that this room should actually be answering. Then they would say, no, it's because of heritage. Then I went to check which heritage. In the Sunday Times, they even mentioned my organization, so I checked around. Who gave any assessment or letter? There was nothing like that, Leanne. Now, how are we going to convince our students that there is no money when there is so much corruption? Why do we think that people who are protesting will understand when we say we need to tighten the belt when we have forever been loosening our belts? <laughs> in fact, in the first place, the belts were elastic. <laughs> now we keep loosening them even further. If I remember well, there is one of the SOCs where the CEO was actually negotiating, leading negotiations that you can't give workers more than 5% CPI. Quietly, he had been given a salary adjustment of 40%. The political psychology of the elite in this country. It is not the people who are receiving the social grants who are a problem in this country, where we talk of dependency, a sense of entitlement. It is the political and the business elite which has a parasitic relationship with the state. With no sense of context, hence the inequalities that we're beginning to see. 
some CEOs 42 million rents per year. The differentials. When they want to do the global comparison of the market, they look for that which will favor them. But when you compare the companies they compare with, the gap between the highest paid and the lowest paid is ignored. Why? It's because the person who stands to benefit is the one who motivates, they set the specs, they implement much to their advantage. And what we are not realizing is that we are in this boat together. If we keep drilling holes in it, the social and political explosion will consume all of us. Even those who have cousins in Australia, in Europe, elsewhere, the situation is getting worse everywhere. So it is better to make home look better. Now, let me come to just three points before I sit down. The issue of corporate social responsibility, which often is taken with a sense of grudging compliance, with no strategic thinking around it. After Marikana was asked by the Chamber of Mines, they said, but why everybody hates us so much? Because look at how much we are giving out. What they were doing, they were giving some municipalities, do what you do, and so forth. There was no coordination, no impact that could actually be understood. Somebody came this year saying, we want shoes for school. They say, take the following year, others say, no, we want a soccer kit, take. The other one comes, and there's just no coordination and therefore no impact. There's no creative thinking. There's lack of imagination. In all what we do, that's why no matter what you say you are doing, doesn't feel like anything is happening. Imagine if the construction industries were to say, there are mad schools, what must we do there? As a focal point during a certain period. Or during this time of drought, when we do have our earth removers in this village, we'll also just dig some dam as a legacy project. Simple, easy. After that, people have their cows, they have water in that space, they can even get, uh, you know, their lives around that particular dam. Instead of waiting for public works department to do things. It is all in the mind. It is therefore my call today I know that as a political scientist, you were expecting me to say what's going to happen to Pravin Gordon next week. <clears throat> uh, is it Cyril Ramaphosa on Kosas and Azuma is going to win? Uh, uh, what about President Zuma and so forth? And some may even be, uh, you know, more imaginative and say, do you think Donald Trump uh, <laughs> is going to win? or that president from the Philippines who seemed to be foul-mouthed. No. The main focus is to trigger our own imagination as a sector. To say what each one of us can do to salvage our situation and have an honest engagement not being defensive, because the problem in any communication is when you listen to respond instead of listening to understand. The other problem is when some of us always believe they have something to say, 
even when they have nothing to say. You know those people <laughs> that you believe they go to a meeting with their hand raised. <laughs> even, <clears throat> even if their agenda changes, they'll still raise their hand. <clears throat> Even when you say any other business, their hand will always be up. Even when the meeting is over, their hand is up for the next meeting. So, <laughs> the space of listening. From 19... I'm not blowing my horn now. From 1987, I was still a university student. I started community projects, winter schools and other things. Some years later, I'm still in that process. And very often, I pay out of my pocket. In some villages in the Alfred and Zoe district, I've even committed to say I'll build a bus shelter for each community every two years. Because when I go to those communities, they tell me, taxes drop us here sometimes when there's rain and you have this 12.5 kilograms of sugar and it simply melts away. Something as small as a bus shelter. It makes such a big difference. And similarly, how can we think creatively in our various professions to transform the apathy geography in our spatial uh, environment that we have? It should not be Lynn West's Sulu's job. We, in our spaces, whether you are doing a gated community complex, in your imagination, are you changing the space to take into account transformation, environment, and just the social ecology? It is that political psychology of how do we relate to this common journey in this space between spaces, time between uh, times. I just want to tell you a story as I sit down and close. You know the value of indigenous knowledge systems. We often just say, ah, traditions, you know, we are modern, 21st century, we should not be thinking in such manner in our profession because we are engineers after all. We can't be thinking back. And yet you look at Chinese, Japanese, Indians. They are inspired by their own heritage. They have modernized without abandoning their own heritage. What can we do as design specialists, as architects, to have that? When we grew up, there were thatched huts in our villages. When it was hot, they are cool. You didn't need fans from game or macro or builder's warehouse. When it is cold, they retain heat. When the child sleeps, they do not hear the zinc noise because the grass muffles the sound. Even if somebody was trying to shoot you, those mud bricks, I'm told, can actually prevent the bullet from going through. But what did we do when for RDP houses? Zinc. When it is cold, that thing is a deep freezer. You have to bring in a heater and people get bent. They die in the process. <laughs> and when it is cold, it's a freezer. When it is hot, that's a microwave. <laughs> and when it is sunset, because the zinc shrinks as the temperature drops, 
you hear the sound, every drop of rain wakes up the child, you take the child to the doctor because this child cannot rest. And sometimes in a worst case scenario, once you hear those sounds, you go to a sangoma and say, I think some Tikoloshe is doing some Michael Jackson on my roof. <laughs> then one day you take your wife, you go to a lodge, you find this lodge with a thatched roof. You pay 5,000 rents. In the morning you say, honey, it was so peaceful, I don't know what has happened. <laughs> <laughs> all you have done you have gone back to your heritage but at a price because you never thought of it as a science thank you professor it is an absolute pleasure listening to you. You almost speak in poetry. You really do. It is an absolute, you, 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 you speak with these words that um, I suppose enlighten us all and, and honestly do give us a lot of food for thought. And, and I think that that's, it, it has to all begin with us. I know that there's so much corruption happening. We all know that and we can't taint that word, we can't. But the reality is in every single industry, it's our responsibility to try and make a difference. And I think that that was the, the key that you were trying to drive through. Uh, in fact, that's the key that's been the theme through a lot of the speakers today. I did promise you there'd be a session where you'd be able to answer questions, uh, well, ask questions and hopefully get some answers. I'm not sure, I, I imagine that there are one or two questions that have uh, arisen from what you've heard so far. If you would like to ask, please raise your hands and uh, let us direct them towards the speaker that you'd like to. Have we got five minutes for that? All right, so it's got to be quick. Let's see who has got some questions. Anyone? Questions? Ah, thank you for switching the light on. That's a bit better, now I can see. Do we have any questions? Doesn't look like it. All right. Well, good. I hope we've appealed to their, their consciousness. And uh, that's exactly what we need. All right. We're going to have a break for about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, um, where you'll be able to grab a cup of coffee and a snack. And then we're going to make our way in here. There's just one thing I need to tell you, please. You'll see that around your neck when you were registering, um, on the, uh, on, your, on the plastic, there's a sticker. It's different, different color stickers. If you do not have a sticker, please go back to the registration desk and ensure that you allocated a sticker. Those are basically for the breakaway sessions that are going to happen a bit later on this afternoon. And uh, you'll be then able to find out which breakaway session you're part of. So if you don't have that colorful sticker, please go and get one. Enjoy your coffee. We'll see you back here shortly. Mm -hmm.